We just watched the documentary, Shiny Happy People. Shiny Happy People. And I grew up in a Christian homeschool family, which when I say that, people think I have a wonderful, great life, which is true in part. I grew up in perfection, performance, and all those things, and faking being okay. So Shiny Happy People really resonated in that, like, oh, wow, yes, life's great. Put on a show. Let's put on a show and make everyone think everything's good. In part because I also believe that Christians were supposed to be perfect because we have Jesus, so we don't have problems, and you definitely don't need counseling because, again, you have Jesus, and if you just pray enough and read your Bible enough, you don't have problems. Is that a confession? I don't know what I'd be (laughs) confessing. Um, No, what I figured out was I was not perfect because no matter how much I prayed and read my Bible and all those things, I still wasn't perfect. It was never good enough. Right. Um, So then I just had to fake being perfect because I knew I wasn't perfect. It sounds exhausting. It is. Um, and I've since realized, like, nobody's perfect. So let's all stop faking, and I don't like fakeness anymore. So um, watching episode two. The thing uh, I want to say, though, before that is just that, um, you know, because this documentary exposes, like, a lot of abuse that happened and tries to paint it as, like, all homeschoolers and all Christians are abusive and bad and all that stuff. And I would say any of them that have been influenced by Gothard's teaching is questionable, at least, if not straight up abusive, but also abuse happens. Christian, not Christian, homeschool, not homeschool. Being a Christian or being homeschooled is not the problem. Following a cult leader who teaches you that abuse is okay, that's the problem. For me, like I'm actually really thankful that I grew up in a Christian community because if I had gone to a public school and had to deal with bullying and all those negative influences, I think that would be a lot harder. This is my disclaimer before we talk about this, that I am very thankful for the good people in our church and in my homeschool community and all the positive Christian influences that I had in my life from my childhood all the way up until now, those people are the reason that I'm okay in spite of everything. So to say that Christianity is bad or homeschool is bad, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater because it's Christian homeschool families yes. are the reason I'm okay. So also the reason I'm not okay. So, <laughs> so while this is all very raw and real and connects to your history, the broad brush stroke paints a picture that's not real. It's sad stories that happened, but it is not the truth and the true experience of everybody in the faith, every homeschooler, and the broad brush broke. The the conclusion is extremely wrong. Now that we've disclaimed that we do not agree with the conclusion. I agree with the documentary in the sense that this abuse happened to people and it is wrong. And people need to know about it. And it's about time the stuff came to light. I disagree with the documentary trying to say that all Christians and all homeschoolers are like this. Yes. Okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of Christian homeschoolers watching this were shocked. I mean, when I first heard about the Duggards and their 19 and kids and counting TV show, I was like, yay, this is really cool. Christian homeschool families on TV. Yeah. I never watched it, um, but I was still excited about it. But then watching this documentary and being like, oh, like they have to all wear skirts. They have to all have long hair. Um, A lot of this teaching where I was like, this is not, like an accurate portrayal of the Christianity I grew up in. Yeah. Um, it paints it, it more like, like a cult. Yeah, yeah, it does sound like a cult. It's, it it's, is a cult. It's because it is a cult. And by virtue of the fact that it is a cult means it is not actually Christian. Even as a Christian or yeah. former Christian thinking about Christianity again, my life was nothing like that. So I look mm-hmm. in and go, holy crap, my Christian experience is nothing, nothing yeah. like that. I've never experienced anything like that. My experience, having watched the documentary, my life experience was clearly influenced by that, even though I've never heard of the Institute for Basic Life Principles. I knew the name Bill Gothard as a famous Christian teacher, book writer, author, person. Oh, he's a famous person who teaches people stuff. I just didn't know what he was teaching. I would have assumed that he was someone who maybe spoke at our church or Bible college, like, just because of the, the, the way the name was familiar um, was someone that people around me learned from so this would be a 80s 90s level teaching although early 2000s sounds like it went on for quite a while yeah can i ask you about why you felt so emotionally reactive and such strong feelings about episode two more than any other yeah basically i now know where the negative abusive parenting tactics that i experienced where they came from fortunately my experience was not as extreme as the people in the documentary I think watching it validated my experience and also validated that what I experienced was super messed up. Um, you know, and the documentary is kind of over the top. With the like, worst of the worst of the worst. Look at how crazy this is. And you're like, oh, uh, this is crazy? Okay. I, 
you know, I thought my life was normal, and I, I'm now aware that there's definitely some things that were not normal. Um, but then to see it over the top portrayed as like super bad is like, okay, wow, interesting. So yeah, the main thing that happened in episode two was Gothard's demonstration at a conference where he's like, if I had a kid that I could borrow, I can show you how to spank a kid and bless a kid at the same time. And some poor innocent child is sent up on the stage for this demonstration, which that in and of itself is like, whose kid is this? Like this poor kid. Um, and then he just kind of, you know, fake, fake spanks and says, you know, you're a good boy and says nice things about him or whatever. Um, but yeah. It was very twisted. It was very twisted because um, it's, I mean, it's physical abuse mixed with words of affirmation and then followed by force affection of like, okay, now give me a hug. And then he's like, no, that's not a no, real that's hug. Not a, give me that's, a better hug. That's not a real hug. And it was really just like sickening to watch that because that was my experience. So to see it played out on stage as like someone is teaching you how to do this. This was taught to people. And like how many other people discipline their kids like this. I'm just wondering, like, what is the psychological damage of physical abuse mi- mixed with words of affirmation and things like that? I personally did not do not remember being blessed while I was spanked. Um, and words of affirmation is one of my top love languages. So I think I'm actually feel a bit jaded watching this video because I missed out on uh, <laughs> having words of affirmation mixed in with physical abuse. You would mix um, some sarcasm in there. Yeah. Like, huh, but it's probably better that I didn't have that. Yeah, I'm glad oh. I can say nice things without triggering you. So did, did yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you kind of went looted into it, but your mom did the hugging thing after getting spanked. Um, yes, I had to hug my mom after I was spanked. Um, and really the only time I remember sitting on her lap or hugging her was before and after being spanked while I'm being lectured on apologizing for what I did wrong. So your only source of affection was through the channel of pain. Yes. Um, so... All affection is painful. No. Not quite like no. that. I Maybe mean, that's not the right way to no. say it. I mean, it was a very twisted form of affection that was not... Affection. It was forced affection. Yes. Um, it's like when grandma shows up and you have an exactly. awkward Italian family where we kissed on the yes. lips and it was very weird and it took me a very and long time to get through. And your grandma wants to kiss me on and the lips and I'm like, nope, yeah. Dwayne had to marry me for that, so... If you're Italian, no grandma. offense. I ain't kissing I embraced you. my Italian heritage. My wife is not Italian. And I did not kiss until I was engaged. So not kissing grandpa, not marrying grandpa. That's weird. Anyway, back to my childhood. Yeah. So my experience was my mom would spank me till I cried and then hold me and comfort me from the pain that she had caused. Spanked you till you cried. Uh-huh. And yeah. like how, like that, that's. Okay, so. Yeah. Mind boggling to like, me. The tension in the air is so thick you can cut it with a knife. But then there's like an awkward physical closeness that is maybe supposed to counteract the internal distancing, like the weird uh, uh. intimacy of force affection that feels manipulative and fake. I don't see how a parent can justify hitting their child until they cry. So I think in some regards, that hug afterwards is there to communicate like non-verbally. I'm validating that she's a good Christian parent for following the rules and spanking me. Um, and maybe also like, I'm forgiving her for hurting me. And it's kind of part of the the fake reconciliation that like everything's okay now whatever i just did wrong has just been swept not swept under the rug but is forgive and forget and move on and the fact that she just spanked me is forgive and forget and we're just all going to move on and pretend that everything's okay stuffed in a bottle um to cause problems later in life yep but yes like i said yes she spanked me till i cried which in the video and maybe i misunderstood this part of the video where they said like spank the kid until they stop crying I did not hear okay. that. Um, I and mean, it's possible I misheard that because I was like, is that, can you do that? I don't know. I was only spanked until I started crying. Um, and like mom would say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I thought this, I didn't say it, but like, then don't hurt me. Like problem solved. Nobody needs to get hurt here. Nobody needs to get um, hurt. You, I yeah. mean, when I first heard you tell me this and you unpacked this, this was extremely shocking. For you, yeah. Yes, extremely shocking. Yes. And I was like, I don't understand what the problem is. This is normal life. Yeah, this is, like, that, that is what spanking means to you. Yeah, I don't the know words, what spanking means to other people. Yeah, not that. I'm just kind of recounting, like, when you told me this. Yeah. Jesus. I don't even know how to spit this out. It was, it was horror. Like, this not a, I mean... My mom could only spank me once her whole life because it horrified her so bad. And she wept and she asked for forgiveness. So, 
like but the no, horror no. goes even deeper. That's not like a spanking. Don't do that. Let me get your attention. That's no that's, physical it's like abuse. A Thirty minute ordeal where I go sit down in a room and sit on yes. her lap and get lectured and get spanked and hug her and pretend everything's okay again and live in shame. So one thing I have to say is that she used a wooden ruler. Because um, the parenting book that she read said not to use your hand, but your hand should be instrument of love and affection, which we don't really have. But so she used a ruler instead. The other advantage to using a ruler, well, where this hurts me when it hurts you, it's like it doesn't hurt her at all. <laughs> but also, like, she wouldn't have to say anything. Like, she could just pull out the ruler. And we're like, okay, okay, everybody straighten up. So hitting with oh. your hand once. Uh-huh. That hurts. Your hand. You like your hand, you're like, I don't want it. Well, that's, that's why like you use a ruler. Um, that's insane. I think that was the the f- crazy looking bearded guy in the, that episode. It was like I don't know who was Gothard. There was a crazy looking guy, and he was fake spanking, sp- fake spanking oh, yeah, the yeah, dog. I was like, I don't know who this character um, is, but yeah, he's yeah. Like, he's he's teaching that, and Gothard yeah. sourced that. Yeah, but I mean, as scary. I got older, to show vulnerability or any weakness um, is just something that's going to be exploited. Really, mm. uh, I'm not going to cry because if I don't cry, I can prove that she can't hurt me. And then she'll stop trying to hurt me because spanking doesn't affect me. Um, so I tried really hard not to cry, but inevitably you hit a kid with a ruler. I guess it didn't really occur to me that she's going to hit as many times as it takes to make me cry. Like, I'm never going to win. Um, and it only took about four hits to make me cry, which you seem to think was shocking. I felt like four was kind of weak and pathetic. Um, in you my should opinion. be stronger, Like, I Becky. should be able to make it to, like, at least six. You should be you able know, to take like more abuse. Um, yeah, that, that's you know, insane. So I get hit four times and then like burst into tears and feel just like weak and pathetic. And um, yeah, I just hated that I cried so easily. Yeah. I mean, I knew that I was technically too old to be spanked. So there was almost just like embarrassing, like that, that I was still bad enough to deserve to be punished in such a childish way. If that makes sense. I mean, I just thought I deserved the punishment that I received. <laughs> you you don't ever deserve that kind of punishment under any circumstances I'm, whatsoever. I'm learning that. Yes, um, I'm glad. No, I mean, I thought I deserved it. My mom always told everyone I was a horrible, difficult, rebellious child. Whenever I was spanked, she always used scripture to back up why I was in trouble. The only scripture I remember her quoting were, honor your father and mother and children obey your parents and the Lord. To honor your parents and obey your parents means agreeing with everything they say, which means I can't have my own thoughts or opinions. If she says red is the best color, I just smile and nod. I can't be like, well, actually, I like blue better because now I'm being disrespectful. Actually, episode one, there's a promo video for the IBLP kids program, and the children say, we learn to obey the spoken as well as the unspoken wishes of those who are responsible for us. I found that very interesting because the spoken wishes are the rules that they've laid out before you. The unspoken wishes are, I have to know what you're thinking, and I have to know that this bothers you. I mean, that's probably where, like, the hypervigilance and reading people comes from, being aware of, like, okay. Don't rock the boat. This person seems upset. It's probably my fault. I mean, I blame myself for everything if someone is upset. Um, Yeah, I mean, so then you get in trouble for things because, like, well, you should know better. Um, You should be able to read your parents' mind and know not to do that because it's annoying. I got spanked less as I got older because I discovered that if I'm not home, I don't get in trouble as much. Um, So once I was old enough to start volunteering at the church office and babysitting and volunteering in children's ministry at church, I was basically at church or babysitting for a Christian homeschool family as much as possible. I mean, I still had to be home every morning and do my homeschool before I could go anywhere, but it's like finish schoolwork and get out of here. Right. So basically, I learned how to run away in a way that is acceptable that my parents could be like, oh, look at Becky. She's volunteering at church. Like, they could be proud of me instead of being like, Becky's running away and hiding at somebody else's house. I mean, I never would have thought to even tell anyone, like, how often I was spanked or anything like that because I had so much shame and embarrassment. And I, like I said, I thought I deserved it. So, um, like, I didn't want people to know what a bad kid I was. Like, if they knew I got spanked, they wouldn't know that I was bad enough to deserve being spanked. You know, and for the most part, people thought I was a really good kid. And so I felt like I was doing a good job of being a good kid outside of my house. So yeah. I kind of wanted to keep up that good kid image. I didn't want them to know, like, the real me gets in trouble, like, every day. I, I still don't understand <laughs> what you could have possibly been getting in trouble for. Well, um, when I was an adult, my mom reminded me of the top five things that I did that I got in trouble for, which I didn't remember any of them until she told me the stories. And then as soon as she told me, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. 
I was under the impression that I did things that were bad and wrong and not illegal, but close to illegal. Um, and I wish I remembered what the five things were, but mostly I was really surprised when she told me these stories because it wasn't things that were bad and wrong. It was just annoying and she didn't like it. And it was kind of like, I got spanked almost every day and that's the five worst things that I did were just annoying things that you didn't like. Honestly, I don't think that the original thing was a punishable offense. Um, but mom would ask like, what were you thinking? And then I'd try to explain what I was thinking and why I did what I did or whatever. It's like you um, asked what I was exactly. thinking. Therefore, um, here are my thoughts. Exactly. But then I get accused of lying and being argumentative and being disrespectful. Like I wasn't allowed to actually answer the question, what were you thinking? Now I've you know violated the honor of your father and mother. And now it's a punishable offense um, that she can justify punishing me for. So in some ways I felt like she pushed me until I did something bad enough that she could justify punishing me Um, provoking right right instigating right but then I felt like I was in trouble for the original thing plus I was in trouble for lying and arguing and being disrespectful each of those things adds to the consequences so it's like you're in trouble and then there's just more and more and more so the consequences are getting worse and worse and worse and sometimes actually I didn't know why I was in trouble but mom would be like don't give me that lying you know exactly what you did Um, which sounds like whatever I did was really bad and really obvious and I should know what it is um but I didn't know what it was, so I'd have to, like, guess. Like, maybe I missed a spot when I mopped the floor. And then she'd go check and then be like, okay, that clearly wasn't the thing. But now if it turns out that I did miss a spot, now I'm in trouble for the original thing. Plus being sloppy and lazy while I mopped the floor. Right. Um, so it's like the part of me that wants to know why am I in trouble, so I'm trying to guess it. But it also feels like a trap trying to get me to confess things that mom doesn't know about. Um, so I'm better off just not knowing why I'm punished. Um, so basically I learned, like, I can't defend myself. I can't explain what I did wrong. I can't do anything like that because it just digs myself deeper into a hole. Um, and even if I don't know what I did wrong, like I can't push her to be told what I did wrong because, again, that just adds to the punishment. I mean, so at some point in life I just learned to, if she yelled at me, like, I don't know why she's yelling at me, but I'll just take the punishment and, oh, well. I mean, I got yelled at for getting like a 95 on a test. Right. Like it was a stupid mistake. You need to slow down and take your time and double check your work. You know, you're being sloppy. You're being lazy. There's no excuse to get that one wrong. And I try to reason with her, like, a 95 is actually really good. Like, most people think that's good grades. Um, But to me and to her, and because of the way that she raised me, 100 is the only good grade. Like, perfect is the only only thing and anything less than that. So, yeah, college was really hard because I did not get 100s. And so I was constantly feeling like I didn't get good grades. But then if I said anything to anyone else, they would be like, you got a B plus. Like, what is wrong? Like, like, they would think that I was trying to, like, backwardsly brag about having good grades and pretending, like, having this false humility of, like, oh, I don't get good grades. It was right. like, just confusing. People it was couldn't like, relate no, to No, no, a B is bad. Like, A, A plus. It should be an A plus. Um, which I think for my mom being a homeschool parent, like, she needed us to all get A pluses all the time because it proves that she's a good teacher. Right. If we get A's. If we get B's, then she's not teaching us well enough. Like, it's a failure on her part, I think. Yeah. Um. She doesn't have yeah. the perfect family. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. This is episode two unpacked all of that. So growing up, did you ever have red flags about being spanked? Yes. Um, one thing was we had foster children at one point and asking our parents to explain like, what are foster children and why do we have them and why aren't they with their real parents? And it's like, oh, well, their biological parents were abusive. Okay. What does the word abusive mean? Oh, they like hit them and stuff. Which I know, like, they could have been abused way more than that, but you know, our parents don't want to explain anything like that to us. It's like, okay, their parents hit them, so I'm like, so like spanking? No, 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 no. This is different, because um, I guess spanking. There's a reason you're hitting your kids, and this is like hitting your kids for no reason. I guess is abuse if there's no reason to hit them. Um, I don't know, but I also think it's like illegal to spank foster kids. I'm pretty sure. It um, probably is. Yeah. And part of having foster kids, like, we also met with a social worker at some point maybe just for initial interview before we were able to take kids. And I knew, and mom had even told us like that we were absolutely not allowed to tell the social worker that we were spanked because a social worker might misunderstand and think that was abusive. Um, <laughs> and then because we, would, it and is. we would end up in foster care. And sometimes in foster care, there's abusive Wait. families and you'd be abused even worse than you were at home. So you're better off staying with your biological family. It was really confusing because I couldn't see the difference between the foster kids being hit and abused and me being hit and spanked, and that's not abuse. Like, I just felt like that line wasn't really clear, the difference between the way I was disciplined and abuse, um, because there's not really a line there. 
<laughs> Surprise, you were abused. abusive. Um, and suddenly everything makes way more sense. But I do think I was best off living with my biological family because it was familiar and predictable and therefore like I knew how to function within that system. And I couldn't imagine being taken out of that family and put in a different family and having to like figure out how to survive in that. Like even I went over to a friend's house and they drank milk for dinner and we drank water for dinner. And I'm like, I do not want to drink milk. This is disgusting. Um, so I wasn't super adaptable. <laughs> so I'm glad I stayed in my family. Well, you were too busy adapting to rough situation. Yeah, but I, <laughs> but I, I feel like I knew how to survive. Yes. Although clearly not well enough because I still got spanked a lot. I feel like if I was actually good at surviving within the system, I would have figured out how to be good enough to not get spanked so much. I don't think not getting spanked <laughs> was an option. And there's that. Okay. that. I mean, the way I'm hearing it, like, right. and seeing it's this. True, especially when I don't like, know what I did wrong. I mean, I think to some regards, it's, it's there's keeping a preventative discipline. Y- like, just it's keeping. Was, you know, I haven't been spanked for like several days. Like, we don't want me to get too cocky and confident and think I can get away with things. So I'm, I'm due for You got to keep your will broken. Yeah. That was actually, that was triggering in that episode where they yeah. said. Break the child's will, but not its spirit. No. Well, the, ap- the episode just said break their will. Uh, but my okay. mom specifically said to a family I babysat for, you need to break her will without breaking her spirit. And I was like, I don't, can you do that? Um, Even at that age? She was like, like two. Like, yeah, and I was like 14. Um, yeah, I was like, can you break one without breaking it? Plus, I'm pretty sure this is what like people do when they take a hostage. They like break them so they are right. submissive and obedient. And submissive and obedient people are easy to abuse. And maybe that's why Gothard taught these parenting principles and then brought kids into headquarters where he could abuse them and get away with it because they're submissive to authority and obedient. They do not Um, know how to stand up for themselves. Yeah, especially to stand up to authority because that's stepping out the whole authority umbrella, you know, God, church leaders, whatever, father, mother. If you step out from under the authority, like God's going to punish you. Um, You're no longer God's will, all those things. So it's like, yeah, I mean, that's what was shown in the video, in the documentary was like, we have to obey authority. Yeah, obey um, the authority. Otherwise, that's over God's going to punish you. So I guess if the authority wants to sexually abuse you, you just have to go with it and hide it. Yeah. Um, which yeah, that was super messed up. Um, that's a crazy journey. So when did you realize, in the midst of all of this chaos, that you were abused? When you told me. <laughs> yeah. So, so like coming back ago, to me wanting to cry—that yeah. is that about a year? Yeah. Not even a year it was ago. Last is it? Summer. It was a year ago. Last summer. Okay. Um, that for some reason I like wrote down a story about being spanked, um, which was actually painful to 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 write well, you, the emotions and stuff. You're dealing um, with post-stress. Post-traumatic stress post- disorder, PTSD. Yeah. And then I think I read it to you, but I don't think I could, or maybe I think I might have just handed it to you and have you read it because I couldn't say it out loud without crying. And you're like, that's abusive. And I'm like, no, but I, I was a bad kid and I deserved it. Um, so then I told the story to my life coach and I told the story to my mentor and and they're all like shocked and just like you were and like that's abusive. And and now I have like this strange enjoyment in telling crazy stories to people to watch their reaction of like, wait, she actually did that. She actually said that. Like, that's not okay. That's abusive. I'm like, okay. So like I'm slowly mirroring that. That like, reaction. Okay. This is how the rest of the world is perceiving this. And so again, watching the documentary and seeing how it's being portrayed and how I'm perceiving it and how people watching are perceiving it is like, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, that's abusive. Yeah. Yeah. That's Um, physical abuse. Yeah. I knew that my dad didn't approve of us being spanked, but every time mom spanked me, she quoted Bible verses. She quoted parenting books. Like every single time I was spanked, part of that like 30 minute ordeal um, included her justifying and validating why she was a good biblical parent for spanking me and why this was the right thing to do. Cause I guess she apparently needed to, remind me and remind herself that she was doing the right thing by doing this. Um, And so I guess, yeah, I thought I deserved it. And I don't, I honestly don't think that my dad has any idea how often we were spanked because it's not like I was going to tell anyone. Most discipline happened while, you know, eight to five while he was at work. Like, I don't remember getting in trouble in the evening when he was home because I don't know. And I think, like I said already, I've always known that I was spanked past the appropriate age to spank kids. Um, but now I'm kind of questioning, like, why is there an appropriate age to spank and not spank? Like, why is it okay to spank a toddler but not a teenager? And, like, you really can't spank your wife because that's definitely abuse, although Gothard apparently teaches that you can spank your wife. So people are shocked. That was weird. Like, you can spank an adult and that's not abuse, but it's like, but you can spank a toddler and it's not abuse? Like, I don't know. It feels more abusive to spank a defenseless toddler. A defenseless little child? Is, is it acceptable to spank a child who's too young to say anything to anybody? And too young to know any better or any different. Or not bigger than you. Or not bigger than you, so they can't take you down. Right. Um, but yeah, once your child is old enough or bigger and bigger than you, like, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Okay. We can change that. 
<laughs> I mean, I was never brave enough to stand up to my mom like that. Um, but in hindsight, it was like, no, I, I could have hurt her back, I think. I don't know. Could have been really therapeutic. The other thing that you found really shocking was just when I said, if a baby has a thick cloth diaper, it makes sense to remove the diaper. So when you spank their butt, they actually feel it. Um, but for me as a teenager, like still having to pull my pants down and bend over my mom's legs, um, like, I was like, this is really messed up. Like, I think I'm too old for this. Um, but she's like, no, you're not. <laughs> um, you know, and even like when I had my period, I was like, well, I hope I bleed all over you. I didn't say that out loud. Um, but like that, like added a whole layer of shame and embarrassment along with <laughs> being spanked and forced affection <laughs> and everything else. Um, which I think also probably is another reason, like I'm not going to tell you when I was spanked because this is what I picture. This is what I assume they're picturing when I say spanked. Um, yeah. The nuance of the word. I was spanked. Oh, no big deal. Yeah. No, you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, if someone else says, like, they spanked their kids, I'm kind of like, uh, <laughs> which at this point, I guess I need to be like, can you explain to me what you mean by that? Um, because I picture my experience. Yeah, as, as you um, should. And as an adult, like, I had a friend who told me, like, a funny story about when she spanked her three-year-old, and he's like, ouch, that actually hurt this time. Um, and I was just so confused. As, like, I don't understand why this story is funny or why she thought it was funny. I don't get it. Um, I was very confused. Um, I guess like, I don't understand, like, She's been spanking her kid. This isn't the first time she spanked her kid. Like, how come it doesn't normally hurt? Um, like, obviously, she hasn't been spanking him hard enough for it to hurt. But like I mean, if you swat. spank your kids until they cry, you should know that it hurts. Um, so, obviously, she's not spanking him until he cries. So, I don't know. I guess I thought the point of spanking is to use physical pain and the threat of pain to scare kids into obedience and submission. Well, certainly was to the Gothards. Yeah, so someone needs to explain to me what is the purpose of spanking if the goal is not to hurt the kid and make them cry. Like, I don't... So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, we don't agree with any form of spanking, but I would think in terms of like intense, strong emotions coming from a human, what can you do to snap them out of that moment? You mean like right. when a kid is misbehaving? Yeah. And giving kind of a little like, hey, or well, right. Well, in this case, you just pull the ruler out. <laughs> fear of a ruler. Um, That's not right. Yeah. Um, um, you know, ouch, that hurt that time. That means she's like, Hey boy, like that wasn't okay. Like, oh, okay. Right, like, yeah. that's, a, that's, yeah, a, that's, yeah, a, like a that's a little swat to get right. their attention. When people say they spank their kids, is that literally what they mean? Is just like a, a gentle, yeah, I don't know. Not, yeah. not this whole take your pants off and get smacked on your empty butt, naked butt with a ruler. Uh, I yeah. don't know. I've never seen um, a kid spanked with well, that, a naked butt. That happened in private. You don't spank your kid well, in public. That's true. Like that. That's true. I um, guess I wouldn't have seen that. That's when you get home. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, Thank you, mom and dad. Would you spank your kids? No. <laughs> good good answer so when our daughter was a year old mom visited for her first birthday um and she lectured me on why i should spank our child um and i have no idea what our baby did that was so offensive as to warrant being spanked but mom was just upset that i would not spank my kid um and she sent me a nasty email which was really sickening to read and she used scripture and quotes from parenting books, trying to convince me that in order to be a good godly parent, like, I need to spank my kid. And if I don't spank her, then I'm not obeying God, and I'm no longer in the safety of God's authority. Um, and under that umbrella of protection, it was sickening to read that. And again, I think still trying to justify and validate what she did to me and needing me to do that to my own children. Yeah. Because that means it was okay. Yeah. And the fact that I refused to treat my children the way she treated me implies that there was something wrong with the way I was treated. Because um, there was. Yeah. Ultimately, I was like, I don't enjoy hurting people, especially my own children. I, like, when they cry, I comfort them. I can't imagine making them cry right. and then comforting them. And I can't imagine, like, hey, come sit on my lap and bend over. And, yeah. Like, I just don't see how that could possibly be healthy for my relationship with my child. <laughs> huh. I don't know why I would think it would be unhealthy for a parent-child relationship. <laughs> so how is your relationship with your mom now? Well... Funny you should ask, because you already know. Um, obviously experiencing physical abuse, um, and probably even more so the psychological and emotional abuse that went along with that, that made me think the physical abuse was okay, and that I deserved it. Um, and then the spiritual abuse on top of that, using scripture to justify it. Obviously, yes, that was very damaging to my relationship with my mom, especially because she can't see anything that she possibly did wrong except not spank me enough, and that is what she said, word for word. 
and I assured her that she has spanked me plenty. And she was like, oh, good. For a minute there, I thought I was a bad parent. I'm like, no, no, if spanking makes you a good parent, <laughs> you get an A+. <laughs> and I think that probably also contributed to a lot of the the religious trauma or whatever they call it, the church wounds, the distrust of church leaders, along with some of the church experiences that we have. Um, you know, all that played into deconstruction because I have to separate what does God and the Bible actually say versus what is the weird legalism that Bill Gothard taught to people that is all twisted and messed up. So that's my yes. version of deconstruction is maybe more like disentangling. That yeah, you use the a strong does. word disentangling your thoughts. Um, which to me is, yeah, separating like who is God in the Bible and what is the truth versus what is the lies that were piled on top of that. That's a whole podcast in and of itself. Yeah. Probably just yeah. an ongoing discussion. No, but I mean, I'm super leery of anyone using scriptures or anything feel that feels like, oh, this is manipulation. Like, Well, nothing fine. should violate your sovereignty like that. Yeah. That whole experience takes away any yeah. autonomy and sovereignty you have as a human being to live under the suppression and oppression and control. Well, hey, guess what? When I turned 17, I moved into the college dorms and was like, I'm never going back. Yes. And when I turned 21, I moved across the country and I lived overseas and I'm really never going back. Yes, we um, live a, we, in America as far away as we could. Somewhat accidentally. But I mean, once I moved away, I literally just took the first 21 years of my life and like put it in a box and put it on a shelf somewhere and was like, all right, that's over. And I just started over and started a new life for myself and... Found a hot dude. Found a hot dude. Yeah, so now it's been 10 years since I've been back to the East Coast. Um, and I said the only reason that I would ever go back is my sister's wedding. And I didn't go. She got married last summer, and we were going to go, but I had to cancel the trip because I have PTSD and can't handle being around my mom. Um, PTSD, if you don't know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um the normal PTSD is like you were in a car accident or you were in a battle or something that causes that triggered experience or whatever. Complex PTSD is you grew up in constant fear of being punished for anything and everything and possibly nothing. Um, thus, it's complicated. Thus, it's, it's complicated, yeah. Um, and I can't go back to her house. Maybe because that feels like coming back under her authority. I go back to, like, I can't defend myself. I can't protect myself. I just have to take whatever she throws at me. Um, which right now is just verbal. It's not physical. But it has been easier since I have Dwayne. Um, but then adding the fact that we have kids is like, I can't protect myself and protect my kids. And I just can't do it. That's what I'm here for. But you can't protect all three of us at the same time unless we all stick together or just stay away from her. Just stay, well, your so mom would we be use pretty distance. easy to protect from a physical. Yeah. But yes, she would use her words. Yeah. But like I said, when I, when I left my mom's home, like I just put everything behind me and started over. And it's really just in the last two years that I've started unpacking that box and doing the, the work of inner healing. Two years ago was when I went back to church. And then this past year, I did like a mentorship program at our church. And now I've got a life coach and a mentor. And I have an adopted mom now too. Um, which has been really healing and also painful. Um, because I've just experienced being loved like a mother, like unconditional love, who isn't judging me for everything. And it hurts to be like, oh, this is this should be normal. But I've never felt loved like this before. Like, I've never had a mom who will defend me and protect me and stand up for me. Like, you do that, you know, as my husband. But I've never had, like, a mom figure do that. Um, they're usually the one who's throwing me under the bus. Um, and the one that I need protected from. So, that yeah, has been really healing. And... I'd say the healing is just starting. But yeah, part of the healing is also being able to share about your experience. Yeah, so share the story with there others. There we go. That is probably the second worst story. <laughs> <laughs> the worst story I don't want to talk about right now. Um, yeah. That's, that's all, folks. That's all, folks. That's, what that's, that's episode. I unpacked watching episode two of Shiny Happy People. Yes. Call it good. If you need help, reach out. Yeah, find a counselor uh, person. Find a counselor. <laughs> we'll help you. If you resonate, we want to hear from you. May God bless your soul.